Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. And Ramadan Kareem to all. Do say from where you're joining us today in the chat. Before I introduce myself, um, I just wanted to say that there is a live interpretation uh, into Arabic for this webinar. لمتابعة الندوة بالعربية اضغطوا على زر أو علامة الترجمة interpretation على شكل كوكب في أسفل الشاشة المرجو اختيار القناة الكورية أكرر المرجو اختيار القناة الكورية للاستماع للندوة بالعربية يمكنكم كذلك طرح الأسئلة بالعربية وسنوصلها للمتدخلين والمتدخلات Let's stand. My name is Hamza Hamushan. I'm a London-based Algerian researcher and activist, and I'm the North African Program Coordinator at the Transnational Institute. I will be facilitating this conversation with my comrade and sister, Miriam Aura, a Dutch-Moroccan scholar activist and a reader at Westminster University in the UK. We have a team helping us to run this webinar, Jess, who will be taking care of the logistics and the technical side. Maha from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, who will be compiling questions from you. Katie, who will be monitoring the chat and posting relevant links. And Dania, who will be recording the interpretation of the webinar into Arabic. We also have Mohammed and Sana, who will be doing the interpretation today. This webinar is co-organized by the Transnational Institute and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, North uh, Africa office. TNI is um, an international research and advocacy institute committed to building a just, democratic, and sustainable planet. For more than 40 years, TNI has served as a unique nexus between social movements, engaged scholars, and policymakers. TNI has been organizing a lot of amazing webinars with great speakers since April 1st last year. And as you can imagine, this comes at a cost. So any support you can help us with to continue doing that work will be much appreciated. The North African office of the German foundation Rosa Luxemburg Siftung was established in July 2013 in Tunis and strives for the promotion of innovative and creative initiatives in the region to support social justice, bottom-up political participation, and cross-societal dialogue. Today's webinar is part of a series that we started organizing from the beginning of the year, focusing on various themes and countries. We had the first one in February around the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt, and it was very successful in terms of attendance and engagement. The focus today will be Syria, Libya, Bahrain, and Yemen. Uh, we had more than 500 registrations, which show the big interest in these issues and the hunger for such radical analysis. The next one will be in June, and we'll cover the second wave of uprisings in Algeria and Sudan, as well as the political and social struggles in Morocco and occupied Western Sahara. This is part of a, of a multimedia project that will reflect on a decade of struggles in the Arab region since 2010 and 2011. Our objective is to challenge some of the misconceptions and debunk the racist and contemptuous cliches and stereotype about the regions of the like Arabs and Muslims are not fit for democracy and they are incapable of governing themselves. Ultimately, we would like to capture the spirit of the revolutions their creative energy, as well as their contradictions, shortcomings, and the enemies surrounding them. Basically, we want to look back in order to look forward. We will try to do this through webinars, podcasts, and a dossier of articles and essays that will come out in the autumn. Before I let Miriam give a brief context for today's webinar, I just wanted to say that you can share relevant links and material in the chat, and if you want to ask questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window to make Maha's life much easier. Over to you, Miriam. So I'm unmuted now. Classic. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Good evening. 
Uh, I just checked in the chat very quickly. Again, it's so overwhelming when people are joining us from all over the world. It's really amazing. South Africa, Indonesia, Bahrain, Egypt, Amsterdam, Oxford. I don't know who that is, next to where I live probably. So welcome to this amazing second uh, webinar. I'm just gonna briefly introduce again, the ideas and the motive behind this. First of all, Ramadan Karim for all of you who are fasting. Uh, Ramadan is a very appropriate moment because Ramadan is supposed to be all about reflection and that's what we're going to be doing today. So the topic of counter revolutions can actually be tough. Um, of course, there are things that we sometimes want to ask, for instance, about Syria, about Yemen, Libya or Bahrain, but some of these discussions have become really tough and people are becoming more reluctant to actually raise questions and issues about uh, these countries in relation to the Arab revolutions. But we have to admit that even though it's already a decade on, uh, it, it's not a century onwards, but just a decade onwards. And for some people, these events in these particular countries uh, have almost completely faded uh, from uh, memory or from even the current debates. So the Arab uprisings, of course, they were celebrated as a world changing event. And we had a great webinar in January when we discussed Egypt and Tunisia, the incredible efforts against authoritarianism. But we already said back then that some of these incredible phenomena and, and people power experiences have also morphed into quite divisive violence. So many attempts to resist the social economic exploitation were met also in Bahrain, Syria, uh, Libya uh, and Yemen with resistance from the state, often in conjunction, as we will hear today, with global capital and foreign interventions. The brutal descent into civil wars in Syria and uh, Libya and Yemen and a succession of crackdowns in several Gulf countries, as well as uh, among them Bahrain, shows us the very cynical proxy logic that is so reminiscent of the colonial schemes that this region is all too familiar with. In other words, the inspiring frameworks and the demand actually of the revolutions bred freedom, justice, and dignity were not enough to push against the waves of counter-revolutions. But why, how, when, and who? So it is in this second webinar of our Arab revolutions, a decade of struggle, that we will discuss all these issues as far as possible in the time that we have with four brilliant guests. And we are so happy to have our guests here today and together here today with whom we will revisit these very key examples so as to help us understand how revolutionary processes are imbued with ups and downs, with gains and setbacks. So let's first get a visual reminder about Bahrain and Yemen, and then we will go over to Hamza. Before the video is set, let me just introduce also very quickly Ala and Helen, uh, the two speakers that will follow after the video. I think many of you who are from the activist scenes and who have followed the events in Bahrain must know Ala. Uh, Ala is a Bahraini activist scholar and is the deputy director of the Institute for Global Prosperity at the University College London. And she's also the co-author of the book Bahrain's Uprising, Resistance and Repression in the Gulf, published by Z Books in 2015. I hope we can uh, have a link uh, in the chat uh, so that people can get access to the book. And Helen, Helen Lechner has worked in all parts of Yemen. And I'm, for me, she's a walking uh, library on, on, on Yemen, incredible experience uh, and, and knowledge. And she's been involved in Yemen since the seventies and has lived there for close to 15 years. She's the author of Yemen in Crisis, The Road to War. It's published by Verso in 2019. And it's actually uh, uh, the American publication of the book that was published by Saki in uh, the UK. And she's at present completing Yemen, Poverty and Conflict that will be published by Rotlish. They are determined to make this a permanent place of protest. A day after the army and police withdrew, the area around Pearl Roundabout has become a tented city. 
with free food, water and electricity. The protesters are pitching camp and they say they won't leave until they get what they want. Zain al Abidin down. Mubarak down. Al Khalifa down. Down, down. Can the king make political concessions or is it too late? It is too late. Too late now. Now people, they, you can hear them. They want to uh, change the, all the government. They want a new government. They want, they want to choose by themselves. They want election. The bar Yeah, I'm muting myself. So I've just introduced uh, the two first speakers. Uh, we've asked both um, Helen and Ella to think about how to give us an overview, how to remind us, how to refresh our memories. I have to say these visuals are also doing a powerful job. Goosebumps all over. Uh, and it's just also remembering like in the honor of these people, we should never forget, right? We should always bring back the beginnings also of these uprisings and not get drowned into the counter-revolutionary uh, framing that forgets about these inspiring uh, openings. So uh, I would like to start uh, with uh, Helen. Um, could you give us uh, an introduction or a kind of overview uh, and maybe like some of the key uh, most important uh, points uh, about uh, Yemen, maybe just in a few, like five, six minutes. Uh, and if you think you're going to go over time, don't worry, I'll remind you. Thank you very much. And thanks for those videos. Um, I just want to remind everybody first that, you know, the revolutions and the uprisings of 2011 were not the first time you had major uh, political demands for political change in Yemen. And indeed, you actually, you know, the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen, 1967 to 1990, was the one and only socialist state in the Arab world. Whatever its faults may have been, but that was the only one. So, you know, and as you said in the introduction, I mean, some of the demands that were made in 2011 were much the same in all the countries. But, you know, to be a bit more specific, one thing I'd like to say is that the revolution in Yemen did not start as a result of what was happening in Tunisia and Egypt. The discontent and the frustration and the demonstrations had started before. There's no doubt that the downfall of Mubarak made a big change. I happened to be in Sanaa that day and suddenly, you know, from the third floor flat where I was working with a friend, uh, the noise from the street, you know, exploded. And indeed, her husband called us in to watch the television and see it all more or less live. So it certainly was, it encouraged people to be more determined, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the reason why it happened, which sometimes is one of the misconceptions that comes along. And of course, the Yemenis wanted, they definitely wanted the downfall of the Saleh regime. They also wanted what they called a national economy they wanted a more democratic regime because let's remember that the Republic of Yemen did have something vaguely resembling democracy. It wasn't quite like Tunisia. You know, elections in Yemen provided, you know, left some real opposition in parliament. It was well manipulated. Ali Abdallah Saleh controlled it. 
But still, you know, there was some real opposition. So what people were wanting is really real more democracy. They wanted an end to the corruption and the cronyism. I think those, you know, in addition to getting rid of Ali Abdallah Saleh, those were the two main demands. Now, you were also asking to, to look at, you know, certain key moments. And when you look at the Yemeni situation, I think the key moment was very much the 18th of March, known as the Friday of Dignity. Until the 18th of March, although members of opposition parties, and all of them, and that means everybody from the Islamists to the socialists, were present in the demonstrations, they, you know, and the basic movement was much more independent and it was not dominated by the parties, nor was it indeed involving any of the, what you can, we call the elite. What happened on 18th of March, when Ali Abdallah Saleh snipers basically killed more than 50 demonstrators, was it, it resulted in a split in the regime. So what you then had was a clear split with a very, very strong military element supposedly joining the revolution. I mean, they claimed to join the revolution. The problem is that their objectives were definitely not the same as those of the people who, had, who were mainly in the streets. So after a March, after the 18th of March, you had, you know, the independent and the more revolutionary elements were sidelined and where they stayed and they were present, but they were no longer the dominant force. The dominant force on the platforms, for example, what you just saw on the video, you know, on the main platform where the traditional opposition parties, primarily Islam, you also had the Houthis who were present. I mean, basically everybody against Saleh was present, but after 18th of March, you then had a series of armed confrontations inside Sana'a, which eventually led to the, tra the, tra the transition um, by the end of the year. I'm not sure if we want to talk about that now or later. So I think the important thing to, to remember is that you know, the split in the regime was played a very important role in what happened later. And I think what's important then, which is something I've noticed isn't mentioned as much with respect to any of the other countries, is really the role of the military. I mean, why did the Tunisians win? They won partly because there was no real military in Tunisia. You know, why did Mubarak go? Because the army sat on their backsides and were quite happy to let Mubarak go because they knew that Gamal Mubarak was not one of them and they didn't want to see a, a non-military take over the country. And where the military were present, we had, you know, the same situation. You had Syria eventually in Yemen, I think in Libya. So I just want to finish very briefly because we can talk later about, you know, what happened in the counter-revolutionary. But really what I think were the important weaknesses and strengths of the movement. You know, I think the strength was that there were a lot of people involved, that it brought together a lot of different social groups. I mean, Yemen has traditional social strata, has different tribes, different groups who'd never worked together. And they suddenly discovered for months and months on end in this changed squares that they had common problems and they had things to talk about and to share. And I think that's something which in terms of the long run is an important factor. But one of the, but the weaknesses they had you know, we're very much the lack of leadership, the lack of program, particularly economically, and, you know, the wide range of views, which is a good thing, but at the same time, you know, made a problem. So, and, and the rejection of political parties. So I will leave it at that and other points can be brought up later. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always so difficult to try to summarize uh, something very complex and long, but you did an amazing job. If I could just find a transcript of this, I'll have my review on anything I'm going to be referring to in, in uh, Yemen in the future. <laughs> I'm going to hope that uh, Allah is going to provide me something that I can copy paste as well uh, for future use. <laughs> so Allah, what do you think in terms of uh, ways to kind of, you know, reflect on, look back and, and give us some of the key milestones of what happened uh, in Bahrain or, or what is still happening, right? So the floor is yours. Thank you, Mariam, and thanks to all the attendees for, for taking part. Um, I, it's, it's, you know, it wasn't just goosebumps, it was painful watching some of those clips because the afterlife of those uprisings, um, even one as short-lived as Bahrain's, 
is still being felt today. It's not a chapter that's closed. It's not something like an old photo album that you can look at. You know, many of the people in the video are still in prison serving life sentences. Um, the kind of uh, the, the vindictiveness in which the regime responded to the protests um, are still playing out today. So in Bahrain, as you saw from the images, um, it was probably in terms of scale, one of the largest uprisings, one, th one third of all Bahrainis took part in, in there were some protests that were so big, you know, even a protest in, in such a small island like Bahrain with 200, 300,000 was a significant number of, of people um, that were that took to the streets. It was quite, it definitely rattled the regime um, for, the, for the three weeks that the protesters managed to take over the streets. Um, and it was, of course, it was um, connected in the forms of unifying expressions um, that were um, made from Egypt and Tunisia in slogans like justice, freedom, people wanting the downfall of the regime and what that meant. So both what those slogans mean in the different contexts and what people demanded may vary from country to country, but fundamentally, especially in Bahrain, I remember filming uh, doing some filming a year earlier and I was wondering why aren't people on the street screaming about this because the scale of corruption um, and material extraction that was taking place in terms of um, the, 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 the kind of um, developments and real estate and inequality, the scale of inequality that existed at the time um, made me all constantly wonder while I was in Bahrain why why this is really this is really angering this is kind of really frustrating but um, I just want to mention here um, the essay by John Berger where the famous one the nature of mass demonstrations in which he says you know these are just spaces in which rev revolutionary awareness is rehearsed mm -hmm. and I keep, keep thinking what are we rehearsing even if we if we didn't think of it as a rehearsal at the time but we learned so much by being in those spaces. Um, but fundamentally, uh, it's easy, I think, to analyze why people were there. It's much harder to understand how each country responded um, to each of the uprisings. And particularly in Bahrain, what flabbergasted me was why would the king allow or invite the Saudi army to enter Bahrain in the way that it did on March the 14th? What, how rattled was he to invite a foreign army? And this is what kind of shocked the world is thinking, why, you know, what are the reasons for that? And I think we haven't done enough analysis or, or, or um, we do not have enough understanding why that would happen. Actually, one of the things recently, I was just looking up at um, Barack Obama's memoirs, not that I like reading memoirs, but Promised Land in the hope that maybe by this point we'll understand the kind of negotiations and conversations that were happening because obviously the fate of the small island was in the hands of the Saudis, the British and the Americans. Who made that call? Why was it necessary? Why was such violence necessary um, to suppress the protest in the way it did? You know, there was one woman that was shot dead in a petrol station. People were mauled over uh, in their cars. There was military curfew um, for three months. And there's a great documentary called Shouting in the Dark that was filmed during that period that captured the kind of fear that, that rang you know, across there. And there were raids every night in which we couldn't go to bed before 4 a.m. because we knew the, the raids in across every village would reach our doors at some point. Um, so, so, so um, you know, these are just some questions that I have around the nature of authoritarianism. But also, I mean, I don't know whether you want us to talk about now, but the kind of um, historical history, particularly in Bahrain, that this wasn't, um, this, you, this uprising was different in terms of scale and form. It was the biggest, but it was also the most brutal. Um, you know, thousands of prisoners, uh, over 200 dead, um, you know, thousands in exile as well. But also the history of, of uprising in Bahrain extends back at least to the 1920s when Bahrain was actually a British, British protectorate. Um, and even when the British left in the 1970s, even at the moment where we had a short-lived parliamentary experiment in the 70s, there was an elected parliament in Bahrain in 1973. The, the Emir at the time had enough. It only lasted for two years. By 1975, <laughs> what the parliament tried to do was, was, um, was make an eviction notice to the American uh, fifth fleet, the, the American military base that was in Bahrain. This, this, this is what happens when you have democracy in, in the Gulf, right? Like one of the first, you know, you might not think it was a priority, but the, the parliament of the 1970s actually debated and voted to issue an eviction notice to the Americans. 
And the Emir said, I've had enough. So two years and that was over. So for the next 20 years, actually, the demands of the opposition and the protesters were around returning that parliamentary experiment, the return of a uh, constitution. It wasn't just some vague sort of demands, wishy-washy demands. They were very concrete demands. We had a, con a, a, a sort of um, a, a democratic constitution and we had a parliamentary experiment. It wasn't perfect, sort of similar to the Kuwait example model. But we just want, you know, we want that the return of that. Um, so, I mean, I can I can obviously go on for a long time um, around the forms of authoritarianism that took place. Um, so, what we saw as well in the response was the return of security advisors. Uh, the former head of the Metropolitan Police in the UK, for example, um, was employed by the King. We had an independent commission of inquiry, to, um, and we had you know a resurgence of this narrative around reform. So while you had this liberal modernist narratives of reform in Bahrain, like um, an independent commission of inquiry that obviously acknowledged all the torture, systematic torture and deaths in custody, yet nothing would change, no accountability would, would ensue. Um, you had the PR firms and lobby groups, but you also had the rise of the surveillance state. So we had mass surveillance introduced after 2011. You know, there are CCTV across the whole country in police stations. Um, and we had also particular, this, 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 this culminates into this normalization deal between Bahrain and Israel. Um, I think with the two are connected, you see the trajectory of authoritarianism culminating into, into the betrayal of one of the region's you know, biggest causes, which yeah. is the liberation of Palestine, which was it's very interconnected to the history of activism in Bahrain as well. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. This is already so much. I think we are going to have to come back to some of the things you raised here also the role, uh, the geopolitical role, also a normalization uh, with Israel and also some of the points that Helen uh, mentioned. Uh, I'm going to uh, let uh, uh, Hamza take over in a moment. So we're first going to watch some uh, 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 more videos and visual representations of uh, Libya and, uh, and Syria in particular. And then the floor is Hamza's to introduce the second and uh, batch of the speakers. These were really powerful uh, videos that captured some of the historic events that took back in 2011. So now I'm going to introduce the two next speakers. Um, Yasser Munif is a Syrian sociology associate professor 
at the Institute for Liberal Arts at Emerson College. He is the author of The Syrian Revolution Between the Politics of Life and the Geopolitics of Death, a book he published with Pluto in 2020. Luckily for us, Pluto is offering our viewers a 30% discount to purchase the book. All you need to do is use the code that my colleagues are going to post in the chat. Lucia Pradella is a senior lecturer in international political economy at King's College London. She works on capitalism, border imperialism in Libya, and the disciplining of labor across the Mediterranean. She co edited. Um, polarizing Development Alternatives to, neo to, to Neoliberalism and the Crisis. And Pluto also are offering a 30% discount on the book for our speakers using the same code. Um, Lu Lucia, I don't have the book, but I promise I will buy it using, using the discount. So yes, sir, and Lucia, you have seven minutes each for your opening remarks in order to set the scene. Yes, sir, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Hamza, and thank you, Miriam, and everyone else who was involved in organizing this um, this important event. Um, I think that uh, we need much more of, of that to uh, to speak to each other and to network and uh, to revisit some of those important moments. Um, it's difficult to speak about uh, Syria. Um, just a few few days or few weeks ago. Uh, we commemorated the 10th anniversary of the revolution in the context of monumental violence and our ongoing killing. And, uh, you know, I, I would start by saying that the violence in Syria um, is, is very old. It didn't start in 2011. Um, it's much older than that. And it's a, a, one of the main features of the Syrian state. Um, the prison system is um, one of the most violent in the region and maybe in the world. And uh, one of the main pillars of, of the Syrian state. Everything in Syria revolves around uh, the prison system. The sec security apparatuses, the army and the Ba'ath party are also very important pillars of the, Syrian, um, of the Syrian state. And the desire for freedom and justice are not new either. They didn't start in 2011, they're much, much older. Tens of thousands of people were thrown in prison as political prisoners before 2011. And many of them died under torture. Um, and the security apparatus in, in Syria has been really uh, the main institution uh, that the, the uh, Assad regime put in place to, to govern um, Syria. Uh, the Ba'ath Party and Abdel Nasser destroyed the emergent democracy uh, in Syria. Um, we have to remember that in the 1950s, there was, um, Syria had multi-party system and free elections. Uh, there were hundreds of newspapers and magazines there was a vibrant cultural and political um, life in Damascus and Aleppo and other cities. And that is what the Assad regime, the Ba'ath Party were facing, the threat of democracy. And that's you know, the kind of state that they built um, to um, a, a coup proof kind of state to prevent the emergence and to suppress any democracy, democratic uh, aspiration and, and desire. And the history of resistance in Syria is not new either. Political opposition in Syria is very old, in fact. Uh, the Syrians have resisted the French colonial power and they also uh, oppose the feudal system. And opposition against the Assad regime has been constant and thousands of people were killed as a result before 2011. And so what I'm suggesting here is that the Syrian revolution in 2011 and, and beyond the Arab revolts in general should be understood as first of all, uh, a regional revolutionary process, but also should be examined in, the, in that uh, long history uh, of, um, of, um, uh, of revolution and political change and, and trans transformation. Um, and so the Syrian revolution is also, I, I will suggest, and that's you know, a point that we can discuss, discuss further, is possibly the most radical in the region. Uh, and I'm saying that uh, because many territories were liberated and um, autonomous political zones were established where people could experiment with a variety of, of different things as, for example, self-governance uh, in the midst of monumental violence, I think is very, very important to think about and to understand and to, to study uh, for, for people who are interested in revolutionary change and in, in radical uh, change and what 
um, you know, what um, we can uh, create beyond, beyond capitalism and neoliberalism. And, and people created all forms of uh, political tools. Um, they created things very similar to the commune. We were celebrating the 150th anniversary of the commune. In Syria, there were hundreds of, of communes. A journalist, in fact, called Syria, the Republic of the Thousand Independent Villages and, and Cities. And there was a lot of variation between one place and another. Um, and some of them were much more successful than, than others. But generally speaking, uh, I think we can learn a lot from uh, what people establish in, in Syria. In each one of those communes, I was, uh, I lived in Manbij, uh, one of those communes for several months. Uh, people created a local or revolutionary council. Uh, in many cases, they created city assemblies where people were invited to meet every week. And there were all sorts of people, communists and, um, and old Baptists who left uh, the Baths, obviously, nationalists, um, uh, Islamists, um, secular atheists, all sorts of people. Um, and they also created their own version of vernacular legal system, their own police um, that is you know, popular and cares about the population. They established countless public publication magazines, hundreds of them, in fact. Unions in Syria were crushed in 1980 and 82. Uh, because of their opposition to the Syrian regime. And it's only in 2012, more than 30 years later, that the first independent labor union emerged in Manbij. Um, student created, <coughs> sorry, I'm uh, emotional. Um, they created uh, unions, uh, uh, teachers unions and students unions and um, engineers and uh, doctors unions. They created co-ops and communal kitchens. Um, there was countless street theaters and graffiti and popular art in, in the public spaces. Uh, and because of the monumental violence against the population, they created playgrounds, libraries, schools, and hospitals underground um, to escape the bombings. Um, there was an entire life underground. And I think they, uh, they were influenced by the Palestinian resistance and their um, underground resistance, as well as the, the Vietnamese resistance. Um, and they think this is um, really a radical um, uh, experience that the Syrian uh, were able to implement in the past 10 years. Uh, the other thing I would say is that Franz Fanon and Edward Said um, have shown us that the process of decolonization in the region was incomplete independence in the region was aborted. And instead, what we saw emerging after independence or quote unquote independence uh, was in fact neo-colonial uh, powers that took, the, uh, took over. And this is why this revolutionary movement should be understood as the continuation of the colonization. Um, there are messy processes that are incomplete. And, um, and in many in many cases, they were countered by various social and political and regional and international actors. Um, but their aspiration for political and economic and social decolonization in, uh, is undeniable if we, uh, we care to listen and if we liberate ourselves from Orientalist um, views. Um, the, today, the balance sheet is bleak, to say the least. Half a million were killed uh, in, in Syria. Uh, more than 100,000 people are in prison. Many of them are disappeared. We don't know if they are alive or dead. Um, and, um, and they are in horrifying conditions. And um, I would invite you to look at uh, the important reports that um, Amnesty International and uh, Human Rights Watch uh, did about Sednaya, which has become, I think, a symbol of um, you know, the prison industrial complex or the prison system in the entire world. Um, really important reports and, and um, they tried to reconstitute the architecture of the prison because, um, because it's, it's, um, it's secret. 90% uh, of the population in Syria lives under uh, the poverty line. 7 million people were internally displaced and another 7 million are outside Syri Syria as refugees. And most recently, Denmark is sending refugees back to Syria um, because they think that it's safe to go back, yes, uh, which is, I think, suicidal and extremely sad. And I will end with that um, just to remind um, ourselves that uh, the Syrian um, who are outside the country are not living an ideal, um, in an ideal situation. Oftentimes, they are facing brutal racism. Um, but again, I think that the revolution process will be long, messy, unpredictable. And that is very clear today. Um, 
there is no going back to pre-2011. Thanks a lot, yes, sir, for these important insights. You made very good points on the, the continuation of the decolonization struggle. And I hope we will come back to some of the points you made in the conversation. Lucia, um, over to you. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me. I will uh, share my screen, my PowerPoint. Uh, so my talk is about uh, Libya, and um, I, I just wanted to start by saying that, um, well, clearly the uprising in Libya in 2011 needs to be understood in the context of the broader uprisings in the region and also in the context of the 2008-2009 uh, global economic crisis and the food crisis that uh, triggered these uh, uprisings. And uh, from my point of view, these movements had uh, quite a big disruptive potential, not just within the region, but also at the international level, including in the core of the imperialist system. And when we think about Libya, we need to think about its position between uh, Tunisia and Egypt, because it's not just a geographical uh, location, but it's also uh, Tunisia and Egypt were a very big inspiration for the uprising in February 2011, and the uprising in Libya also shared this same demand for the downfall of the regime. Uh, rather than a social revolution per se, in my view, the mobilizations of millions of people, uh, workers and oppressed people in the region uh, relaunch uh, the democratic and anti-imperialist revolutionary process in the region and also reacted to the crisis of Arab nationalism. This was also the case in countries like Libya that uh, over the years maintained a real but declining level of conflict with the West. So Libya was a middle income country, had consistent oil revenues and relatively good social indicators. And in the wake of the global economic crisis, it didn't experience the same level of uh, social and economic distress as other countries in the region. But still, Libya was experiencing mounting social and political discontent uh, for a series of reason, uh, reasons, starting with the authoritarian nature of the Gaddafi's regime and its overblown security and paramilitary apparatus that uh, enforced harsh, a harsh repression on any form of dissent, the future, uh, the failure to diversify the economy and the increasing dependence on oil revenues in the wake of the process of opening up to the West uh, after 1999. And the fact that oil revenues were increasingly invested in international financial markets uh, rather than in production and basic, basic services and also were appropriated by a small um, oligarchy or invested abroad, including in the rest of Africa. And these kind of uh, shifts helps ex help explain the worsening of the social conditions among, uh, among the, amidst the enrichment of the ruling family. And the fact that uh, a reformist elite uh, led by Saif Gaddafi was implemented a series of IMF endorsed liberalization and privatization programs that reduced the state's ability to ensure political stability by redistributing oil rent to the Libyan citizens. And so what we witnessed was the stagnation of wages in the public sector where the majority of Libyans were employed and also increasing levels of unemployment that uh, in 2010 reached around 30% of the overall population with the youth unemployment at 48%. And despite these levels of unemployment, Gaddafi actively encouraged immigration from sub-Saharan Africa, while at the same time, and the rest of the Middle East, while at the same time also extending his collaboration with Europe and uh, the ex-colonial power, Italy. And the uh, immigrant workers uh, really represented the most exploited sectors of the Libyan proletariat. They faced, um, institutional racism that was actually uh, well increased by the uh, collaboration with the European Union. And at the same time, trade unions and all forms of political community organization were banned. The last factor in my view is the marginalization of Cyrenaica and the fact that Gaddafi adopted strategy of 
uneven development that marginalized and impoverished rubber regions. And this fueled an Islamist opposition that Gaddafi had brutally repressed, and in particular in Abu Salim, who was a, a prison in which basically a riot broke out in 1996 and uh, 1,200 people uh, were killed. Um, after this. And this is quite an important event uh, in order to explain the uprisings because it was um, the family, uh, the families of the victims of this uh, massacre who began the revolt on the 15th of February 2011 uh, when security personnel ar arrested a Benghazi based lawyer who was represented these families. And inspired by the successes in Tunisia and Egypt, the angry crowds uh, grew larger and larger and started to demand the fall of the regime. And on February 17, uh, protests spread in the East and uh, braved the brutal crackdown uh, by Gaddafi's security forces and a series of cities like Misrata, Benghazi and, and so on, liberated themselves and started also some experiments of self-organization. In terms of uh, the components of the uprisings, I believe that like in Tunisia and Egypt, they began largely as an un unarmed movement that involved heterogeneous social forces like the youth, many unemployed uh, young people, local and tri tri tribal forces, jihadist, pro-imperialist groups. But uh, differently from Tunisia and Egypt, the role of organized labor was much weaker. And I think this was one of the um, issues that really helps explain uh, the kind of um, unraveling of events in, in Libya. Gaddafi, as it's well known, responded uh, to these uh, protests by making on the one side some concessions and also through violent repression and threats and, and so on. And this kind of repression, of course, pushed for the militarization of the protest and also marginalized the youth and civil society forces and also reinforced the series of uh, tri tribal, jihadist, and militant Islamist forces, and also favored the rapid emergence, which is surprising if one doesn't think about all the kind of background work that uh, uh, Western imperialism had done. So the kind of uh, rapid emergence of a new leadership within the National Transition uh, Council that soon gained international recognition from imperialist powers, starting from France, that had been slightly marginalized in, in Libya and wanted to kind of expand this, its sphere of Lucia, influence. Lucia, could yes. you wrap up? Yes, I'm wrapping yeah. up. Yeah. And, um, and so I think that uh, a series of powers could actually, both Western power and regional powers like Qatar could exploit the situation in order to intervene militarily in, with the pretext of uh, defending the, the civilian population. And, and this led to quite um, harsh and ruthless, mili ruthless military aggression that uh, uh, also targeted uh, infrastructure, water pipelines, and precipitated the exodus of uh, immigrant workers. Well, I, I just want to conclude by saying that from my point of view, this war was actually aimed at terrorizing and disciplining not just the Libyan people, but the entire revolutionary movement in the region, and aimed at deepening the new colonial uh, exploitation of Libyan and African resources. And People like Sarkozy said it quite clearly that increasing this new colonial control over Libya was key in order to save the euro and overcome the eurozone crisis. I'll stop here. Thanks a lot. Lucia, Which clearly the... didn't work anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Lucia, for these insights. Uh, I'll, I'll hand on to Miriam right now so we can start a conversation. Yes, thanks so much. Uh, I feel like we've already been discussing for an hour. There's so much information packed in this. And thank you for the slides as well, Lucia. Always very helpful. So I wanted to move the uh, discussion uh, on a little bit. Uh, some of it is touching on what all of you have already mentioned in your introductions. And so we wanted to use the opportunity to expand particularly on the question of counter-revolution also because obviously this is also a very important uh, theme of today's uh, webinar. Well, what we've seen is that the four uprisings 
they obviously don't only share in the similar conditions and motives uh, to uh, uh, repeat what you've all, uh, or most of you have already said, the actual you know, uh, core of the motives and, and, and reasons why things have happened the way they have is discontent with authoritarianism, as also Allah said very clearly uh, about Bahrain, and also economic disposition, as also Helen uh, explained, but also they share some of the outcomes. So internal and external counter-revolutionary forces are a very clear uh, shared uh, experience. These forces have played quite, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say key role, but a major role in crushing the people and subduing the revolutionary uh, spirit, right? That's why we all also get a bit emotional to, to realize what the crushing really means. As Ara also said, many of these people are still suffering, are in prison, or as uh, yes, uh, reminded of, uh, the, the disappeared. Uh, it's, it's an incredible trauma. So these are both international and regional uh, forces. So we can think in the level of NATO, but also on the level of Daesh or ISIS. So we think it's important to actually look at these forces as well, besides the revolutionary forces we've just uh, discussed, because we need to shine a bit of a light on the constellation of these counter-revolutionary forces. We think that by actually better understanding why revolutions fail or succeed, that we can also be much more honest about the different possible trajectories that always will be in place. So there's no point of escaping or hiding behind these trajectories, but also behind these uh, reasons why revolutions fail. So I'm gonna ask all of you to give me please an indication of how the counter-revolutionary forces manifested itself in your context. So I wanted to start with the first two speakers because uh, uh, we want to give uh, the last two a bit of a break. So um, uh, Helen, could you tell us uh, a little bit about how these counter-revolutionary forces uh, that could be both regional or internal and uh, external manifested itself uh, in Yemen? And then I'm going to ask the same also from uh, Ala about uh, Bahrain. And just a few minutes. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think I started saying that earlier and I stopped there, which is when you talk about the split in the regime in after in 2011, you know, the result was that you then handed, had it up, handed up internally with a struggle of military struggle, which started between branches of the Ali Abdullah Saleh regime and other elite forces that were against him. And I think this is maybe the time to mention, you know, the, the, the solution that was that emerged in the end of 2011 was what was known as the GCC agreement. It's actually quite interesting that the GCC chose to give its name to this. Number one, the original uh, deal actually was a Yemeni deal discussed in Yemen by Yemenis in April. Uh, but the GCC chose to give it its name. And again, the GCC were not alone in this because it was actually also supported by the, you know, the group of 10 ambassadors who were a group representing what was known as the Friends of Yemen, established a year earlier as basically a, a, a development approach to counterterrorism. I mean, that's really summarizing it as crudely as you possibly can. Um, and, you know, so you had the, the US, you had the Brits, you had the French, you had the Germans, you had the Japanese, you had the Russians, you had everybody in, in there. So everybody supported this deal. And the thing about this deal is that it was basically intended to, to get rid of Ali Abdullah Saleh, but without having a fundamental change in the regime. I, what the young revolution we were talking about in, in the beginning of the year who wanted these very fundamental changes, you know, this was basically going to, to make it into maybe a, a, slight, a less autocratic, less authoritarian, but still a regime committed to the same right. uh, tendency. Given the yeah. Yeah, that's really great. And thanks for also bringing in the issue of the GCC. And thanks for Hamza for translating that <laughs> in the chat. Uh, Ala, what is your uh, view on this question? Um, I think my view is that um, I think there's we, we tend to fall into a binary when we discuss revolutions as if to deny that, you know, to, to say that these revolutions were um, born out of pure, pure, simple aspirations and demands by citizens for basic rights is one thing. It's not to deny them that when we also acknowledge 
that these weren't domestic affairs, that ultimately a lot of the outcomes were determined on a regional, if not an international level. And then we can consider our positionality as protesters, as citizens, vis-a-vis -vis this, this kind of the, the regional um, power dynamic that was going on at the time. People in the squares were not thinking at that level and scale at the time, yet they had to pay many of the, the, the price for ultimately the kind of packs and security arrangements that followed. Um, and, you know, I just find that sometimes in, discuss in discussing these, it's as if it's either or. Um, I can acknowledge, for example, in Bahrain, protesters were accused of being Iranian agents, and there was a perception by the state that it blew up. There was a Trojan horse that was created that if this revolution succeeded, it would be taken over by Iran. And this fueled as a kind of the sectarian, regional sectarian perspective of Bahrain's difference somehow. It's, it's a sectarian problem going on there, right? So we knew this was playing at that level, even though if domestically it was very simple, it was around, around basic rights. This is not, you know, and then how that is then expressed politically in terms of, you know, the US, Saudi Arabia and Iran relations, where Bahrain fits in the negotiations they have in the same kind of new colonial way that the region was cut up in the past and shared between um, imperialist powers, that this is exactly the kind of um, dealings that we're seeing in different states where there is a civil war, you know, in Yemen and in, in so, so again, my, my view is that um, that international dimension determined some of the outcomes. It was very easy in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, in, you know, Bahrain has become completely dependent on, um, on Saudi Arabia economically, militarily, politically. Um, the regime took that decision after 2011. Um, it's a post-oil country, so it's not this idea of a rich rentier state that can buy off citizens mm. anymore. It's a completely different dynamic. Yeah. So this was a decision that took place in Bahrain elsewhere. You know, the, the, the idea that the protesters in Bahrain could become armed or that it could take a different trajectory was was very much different. And then that brings it it that brings different questions around um, the ability of the opposition to 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 either go down different course, take take protest down a different course with different outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, really, really great that you also brought in the aspect of how, you know, the outcomes are determined not only by the internal uh, motives, but also what you mentioned about dependencies. We cannot generalize these countries and the level of dependencies also is an algorithmic uh, element in the analysis, right? That's really important. And I think it brings us also very close to the Libya scenario, Lucia. How, how do you view this kind of like in a non- binary way, right? This this relation between internal, external, uh, and how th both shape the outcomes. Yeah, I think that the um, Libyan uprising faced a combination of uh, anti-revolutionary forces, of course, uh, Gaddafi forces, um, the leadership of the NTC and uh, the Libyan militias as well, and the Western and the regional powers. I think the kind of uh, main anti-revolutionary role has been played by Western powers because uh, what they really aimed at was to prevent the extension and the radicalization of the uprisings across the region. And so in that case, the intervention had the direct uh, anti counter-revolutionary objective. And of course, the second objective was to replace Gaddafi leadership with a more reliable pro-Western leadership. But the front that was led by Western powers uh, um, didn't, uh, wasn't just composed of them or faithful allies, but it also included the Arab and the Middle Eastern bourgeoisie, like Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and also China and Russia, because despite the reciprocal antagonisms, all these uh, states are united in opposing the popular uprising and also the global challenge that this uprising represented. And now it's quite clear that they are also united in trying to divide the booty in um, in Libya, most obviously oil and gas uh, reserves and also reconstruction contracts. Um, yeah, the, the other thing I think is that, uh, um, yeah, so on the one side, you have a series of forces. Of course, the National Transition Council was a quite uh, divided internally. 
And uh, I think that the fact that they started immediately to implement neoliberalism, they also allowed uh, laws that basically allowed retaliation against Gaddafi, for, Gaddafi forces and so on, really led to a um, cycle of uh, kind of violence and retaliation in, in Libya. And basically they weren't really, the new government wasn't able to respond to the popular demands. There was quite a weak uh, labor movement in Libya. And so what we have witnessed is the emergence of militias that, uh, yes, I, I will finish, emergence of militias that I don't think they, I mean, they just, uh, for example, when they, uh, well, they killed the US ambassador in Benghazi in 2012, they showed that they didn't want to just, just be the puppets of Western imperialism. And at the same time, Western powers increasingly relied on them in order to carry on with the uh, extraction of Libyan resources. So I think there is a bit of a complex relationship there. Yeah, complex in the least indeed. And uh, yes, sir, I mean, you are kind of like the walking, uh, walking example of uh, the false binaries, uh, having explicitly <laughs> denounced the foreign intervention, you're still being referred to as the person who is for foreign intervention. So sometimes it's surreal when we discuss this in the context of Syria, right? It seems like that Syria is the most sort of complex example of getting these uh, questions right, like the balance between uh, local, international and interventions, both in its design locally and regionally, Daesh and the whole uh, development of some of the other forces. Can you maybe just in a short, uh, bring some enlightenment to the, the rest of us who are still confused about how this is projected on Syria? <laughs> No, yeah, I mean, your point about um, either imperialism or dictatorship is a binary that only benefits dictators, right? I mean, if you put it in those, uh, in those terms, that kind of equation. Um, what I would say about counter-revolution in Syria and beyond, I mean, counter-revolution is an intrinsic part of any revolution. Uh, think about the uh, French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution. I mean, any revolution we can go back to and, and um, really look at the counter-revolution. It's unavoidable. Um, but in the Syrian case, the Assad regime wanted to prevent the revolt to be seen or understood as a confrontation between a despot and a population aspiring for justice and democracy. And in that sense, it, it deployed a number of different strategies to prevent that from happening, from being the main narrative, a narrative about uh, democracy and, and, and justice and, uh, and uh, liberation. And uh, we can look at a number of different uh, facets of, of that counter-revolution. I will cite four or five, maybe. Um, the sectarianization of, of the conflict, the militarization, the internationalization, um, the weaponization of the diversity of Syria, and uh, finally, the patriarchy. So quickly, um, the Syrian regime obviously understood that um, the um, confrontation between uh, the population and itself would be um, uh, a big failure. So it pushed for sectarianization. It, it sent the Shabiha, the Alawi Shabiha to attack Sunni villages by massacring the population and by doing that, neutralizing the secular segment of the population and amplifying the opposition between the different sects, uh, scaring the, the Alawi and the Sunni and the different sects. Uh, and, um, and in 2012, and that's a really interesting episode, the Syrian regime released thousands of fundamentalists and four of whom were leaders, major leaders in uh, the ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Jaysh al-Islam and Ahrar al-Sham, the four main um, uh, fundamentalist uh, uh, um, forces. The internationalization um, also is very important for the Syrian regime. It invited uh, foreign fighters, Hezbollah, Iran and so on, and pulling the Gulf and the West to oppose them on, on the Syrian uh, land. The militarization of the war, instead of peaceful protest, it, pu it pushed for militarization and force by weaponizing healthcare, targeting fuel station, bakeries and schools, and, and so on and so forth. And finally, uh, the um, weaponization of demographics, the diverse demographics of, of Syria, um, by, by using the, the, the tribes, for example, to crush the Kurdish and the Druze revolts even before 2011. And uh, during the conflict, we've seen that in so many different ways, countryside against city, uh, different sects against each other and so on. 
And finally, I will say briefly uh, just a few words about patriarchy. I think this mm -hmm. is a really important weapon that the Syrian regime used against uh, the revolution. Patriarchy permeates all levels of Syrian society. And the regime used patriarchy during the revolt very skillfully to undermine the revolution. Mass rape is one of the powerful tools that the Syrian regime uh, used against the population. And the irony is that on the other hand, the Syrian regime presented itself as secular and modern and feminist, according to some uh, accounts. Uh, the Assad couple uh, were you know, presented as Western, a Western couple facing uh, primitive and fundamentalist uh, um, forces. And it was able to project that idea that uh, it's feminist, it's secular, and uh, on the other side, there are savages, pre-modern, violent, fundamentalist groups. So um, thank you. Thanks. The following question is for Ala and Helen, and it's related to the counter-revolutionary actors. I think it would be good to, to know why exactly did Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates intervene in, in, in Bahrain and Yemen. Perhaps you can remind our viewers of the wider historical legacies and the role of the Gulf um, Cooperation Councils, which is described by many as a sub-imperial bloc upholding the regional and global order. So how does this unfold in the case of, of, of Bahrain and Yemen? Ala and then Helen. Thanks. Um, like I said, I was reading um, Barack Obama's memoirs, not because I think it's particularly important, because I thought he'd comment on what happened in terms of the, of the conversation between the US and the GCC. So the GCC completely blindsided America and the US. They just went into Bahrain with no announcement took everyone by surprise. There was a parallel kind of dialogue that was happening behind the scenes. And when Obama says he asked Mohammed bin Zayed, um, Mohammed bin Zayed told Obama, yeah, that the public message does not just affect Mubarak, like what you did with Mubarak and the kind of statement supporting the protesters, it affects the whole region. And if Egypt collapsed, there would be eight other Arab leaders who would fall, which is why he was critical of Obama's statements, he's saying, he said. And so he says at the end, um, he said this was a warning that Mohammed bin Zayed sent. You know, what happened in Bahrain was a warning to the US. Yeah, um, that what happened in Egypt cannot happen in any other country unless it's done on GCC terms, right? And so again, this was bargaining between the GCC emerging as this military interventionist um, uh, collective, um, but uh, you know, with this experiment that was happening in Bahrain to then being able to get that kind of confidence to go elsewhere in, in Libya and in, and more proactively in Yemen or more directly in Yemen, I mean. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this was just a testing ground Bahrain and it was a really warning that we are taking back as a military, you know, we are going to be the, the biggest military uh, power in the region, especially with the de that decline of, you know, Iraq with Egypt, with the kind of former old powers in the region. Here, here we now see the resurgence of this, the Gulf states in that in that process. Now, just one more thing, which is to which is to say that what happens is a counter-revolutionary phenomenon in the Middle East um, around the rise of nationalism. This is the scary part, right? Like it is not to, they, there was a crisis of illegitimacy, there was a crisis of authority, but these people now have maybe even bigger loyalist support bases in Egypt, around Sisi, in Bahrain, around, you know, there is a rise of ethno-nationalism and the sectarian narrative, that kind of, um, you know, the, the hard man approach, the kind of Trumpian hard man approach to kind of crushing protesters increases the popularity. It's a popular, these are populists now. And, um, these were trends that, that, that we were witnessing that has also, have also continued to spread. It's not just the policing, it's not just the military aspect, it's also that kind of the rise of fake news, disinformation, it's all began, the surveillance all began. I mean, we, you know, when we were studying behind, this isn't just a small state, this was a lens into some of these trends that were happening regionally and globally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so, so, so um, again, yeah, this is a lot of, a lot of things around, um, the rise of ethno-nationalism and actually these 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 uh, the, the rulers increasing their law. You know, it was hard to see your own citizens applauding the kind of repression that was taking place. You know, this is these states are now polarized, yeah. um, and that's the kind of the longer damage I think that we need to recover from. Helen, yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, I think if one's starting to talk about the Saudi role in Yemen. <laughs> 
we could be here for another three hours. Uh, in anticipation, I just made a quick list. You know, the first Saudi intervention in Yemen was in 1934. You know, so, let, you know, let's, uh, but I'm not going to go into that. Then there's a whole period of 60 to, uh, 62 to 70 when it was actively involved in the civil war in the, what was then the Yemen Arab Republic. Then there was its actions, you know, against the PDRY basically from 1967 until roughly 1986 when there was a mutual diplomatic recognition. And then just more recently in 1994, you know, the Saudis promised to support the, the separatists in Aden who tried to declare separation for united Yemen. And then once they had done it, they let them down. So, you know, that's before 2015. I mean, so, or even 20, 2011 and the, the GCC agreement we're talking about before. And I think, you know, this is, um, you know, the, the Saudi involvement in Yemen is on its own, largely for its own interests. I think, you know, talking about them being sub-imperialist, yes, it is maybe true, but basically the, it's important to recognize that they have their own agency. And I think it's a mistake to pretend or to say that, you know, the Saudis are acting as proxies for the US or the UK, or indeed, you know, any of the, just as one says, the Houthis are acting as, as proxies for Iran. You know, basically, all these outfits have a, their own interests and their own involvement in Yemen, which may or may not be closely allied with mm. the Western imperialist uh, positions. So I think, you know, these are, these are important things to, to, to notice. And certainly, you know, the UAE interest, uh, I mean, for example, what we see now, and okay, you want me to wrap up, so I won't yeah. go into it in detail, but basically what we're seeing now is a rising conflict between the UAE and the Saudis in Yemen, where, you know, they're increasingly divergent. And, you know, you, and clearly that this has everything to do with their local interests and probably let much less to do with the interests of the US and others in general. Thank you, Helen. Over to you, Miriam, for the next question. Yeah, let me just unmute. Uh, sorry, I was distracted by uh, the amazing uh, this, uh, contributions in the chat. Uh, so many people with different uh, angles. Uh, I'm glad that we're actually uh, tackling some of those here. Um, so actually, I wanted to ask, uh, to continue on this discussion and ask also uh, uh, Lucia, maybe if you can uh, take us to um, the uh, also complex, but very forgotten, I think, context of uh, uh, Libya. I mean, in retrospect, we can all, of course, be uh, seen as experts, you know, when you have the knowledge in uh, uh, afterwards, you can say, yeah, but this shouldn't have happened and that shouldn't have happened. But I think critical insight is still very important so that we can learn lessons, as we said before, so that we can also anticipate uh, and to produce therefore foresight. We don't want to just have hindsight, right? So taking into account this sheer destruction and as you said, chaos in Libya, uh, don't you think that the calls for intervention uh, from uh, different imperialist powers, um, even from some sections of the left, uh, to overthrow what was indeed a brutal dictator, were actually perhaps misguided? Or do you think that, uh, considering the fact that uh, the militarization was already uh, becoming a fact, uh, this was inevitable? What is your hindsight uh, foresight on this? Uh, well, from my point of view, I think uh, in the light of what I presented, these calls were pretty misguided, especially from those uh, within the labor movement and uh, within the left, uh, who, from my point of view, were unable to draw the lesson from previous uh, so-called uh, humanitarian interventions from uh, Yugoslavia to Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and so on and so forth. And this kind of cause uh, strengthened the idea that uh, imperialist powers were attacking Gaddafi in name of the rebels' demands and aspirations for freedom with arguments that were sometimes uh, colonialist, sometimes humanitarian, but I don't think there is a radical difference between the two, position, the two positions. 
And I think that the problem, especially for those who belong to the labor movement, is to put forward the idea that uh, it's not uh, mass anti-war and uh, mobilization and solidarity with the uprisings that can make the difference, but uh, it's the imperialist powers. But I, I also think that also those who didn't support the protest against Gaddafi were a problem, those who presented uh, him as an anti-imperialist leader and uh, hid uh, his responsibilities and his crimes, and also downplayed the demands and aspirations of the Libyan people. And uh, there are these theories, like Russian theories of the color revolution, that basically portrays entire peoples, especially in the Middle East, as basically puppets in the hands of um, big powers. And I think this, also, this is also a problematic position because uh, it, it sees the role of states and big powers in history and doesn't see uh, the role of the masses, of the working people and, and the oppressed. And I think that the kind of combination with these, these two positions, like the fatal combination, helps explain why there has been so little mobilization against the Libyan war, uh, including uh, in, in, the, in the West, but also in, in the Middle East itself. And also that the fact that, yes, I'm, I'm closing, that many people didn't see this as an ag aggression aimed against all the Libyan people, not just those loyal to Gaddafi. And in the last instance, as an aggression against uh, the Arab uprisings in general, and also in the last instance against working people in Europe as well, uh, because this, this was part of a global class struggle from my point of view. Thanks, thanks Lucia for this. And my question now is to Yasser. As, oh, as you know very well, we cannot talk about Syria without touching on just how divisive uh, this uprising has been among the left. Uh, we are organizing this webinar to, to offer, uh, to provide a space for critical debate, uh, precisely because we realize the negative impacts of such trench positions over the years. Um, more than often, debates about Syria turned into deeply polarizing binaries. You are either pro this or anti that, if you dare to criticize Assad and his allies, Russia and Iran, for massacring his own people, you would be branded a stooge of Western imperialism. If you emphasize the geopolitical dimension or the role of Western imperialism, you can be framed an Assadist. These false dichotomies are both alienating and exhausting, um, and they prevent serious debate <coughs> when it comes to questions of revolutionary strategies and international solidarities. So I'm wondering, how can we overcome this, these? Can't we be both anti-imperialist and anti-authoritarian at the same time without downplaying the brutality of dictatorial regimes and the imperialist designs these countries are facing? And also there is, there is the other question of the Palestine liberation. How can we reconcile the, um, the, the contradiction that Syria alongside Iran and Hezbollah are considered to be belonging to the resistance front against Israel? I know it's a very complex question, yes, sir, but I'm sure you can give it a go. Yeah, thank you. I will start by uh, actually the end of your question, which is uh, the liberation of Palestine. I think that uh, Syria, Syria, Iran, Hezbollah have really instrumentalized the Palestinian struggle uh, and have used it to further their own interest, uh, state interest and, uh, and stay in power. Uh, and that the liberation of Palestine require popular resistance, um, you know, something that the Syrian regime has fought uh, for, for decades and uh, put many pe people who were trying to create resistance against, uh, against Israel uh, in prison. Um, and we have to also remember that the Syrian regime crushed the Palestinian resistance in the 1970s in Lebanon, that the Syrian regime joined uh, the, um, the uh, U.S., um, war in 1991 by signing the army, and the army wasn't deployed because of fear that Syrian soldier was would desert; they would not fight their um, brothers in, in Iraq. So that's that's important. I think that um, there is no liberation in Palestine without the end of dictatorship in, in the region. Um, that's a prerequisite. But to go back to this question of imperialism, anti-imperialism, and um, the question of of dictatorship, I think. Um, it's not possible to have liberation in the region without both. Uh, 
uh, opposition to imperialism and opposition to dictatorship. That they are actually dictatorship is a continuation of imperialism uh, in, in the region. Uh, and as I suggested before, Franz Fanon and, and Edward Said have shown us how those regime emerged as a way to, uh, to create neo, neo colonial forces uh, to implement the Western agenda in, in the region. Uh, but I think the ma major problem with uh, some of this left um, in understanding imperialism and anti-imperialism is to reduce imperialism to number of states, that there are states that are, uh, are imperialist and there is an imperialist camp and anti-imperialist camp, as if we are still, uh, and that's the legacy of the uh, Cold War, obviously, that there are two main camps, the imperialist and the socialist, and we have to uh, side with one, and there is no, um, no space in, in between. Uh, instead, what I suggest is to understand imperialism as much more than that. Imperialism understood from below is uh, class relations, international class, re class relations that transcend the state. Um, and there are imperialists in every country in the world. And oftentimes they uh, build alliances among each other, that there are imperialist countries like the US and, and the West in general, but there are also sub imperialism like China and Russia. And there are regional imperialism like Iran and, and Saudi Arabia. And so all that complexity should be understood. And the problem with that kind of left is um, it used imperialism as a pretext to crush those revolution. Um, finally, I would say that, you know, imperialism should be expected when, uh, whenever there is a revolution, when there is, uh, there is political transformation, imperialism should be expected. And that is the starting point for any radical left to begin to think about how to support a revolution, knowing that imperialist forces will get involved, that Russia and Iran and the US and Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Israel will not stand by and just watch things happening in the region. And that should be factored in into our uh, you know, political equation. How do we make it you know, a, a successful revolution, knowing that Qatar and Saudi Arabia are, in, are going to intervene, not say, oh, Saudi Arabia and the US are, and Israel are intervening, I'm out of this, I'm neutral, I'm gonna step aside. And that is very, very uh, dangerous. And that is unfortunately part of the position of the left. Uh, and it had lethal, uh, it had lethal consequences. Um, it's actually the title of my book, which is opposing geopolitics to grassroots. Uh, understanding uh, those revolution in geopolitical terms and reducing everything that is happening as uh, as countries against other as class uh, as uh, uh, country interest and state interest as opposed to understanding them from the standpoint of the grassroots the wretched of the earth to use fanonian um, concept again yeah shall we continue with the q and a questions uh, hamza Yes, Miriam, okay. let's go for it. So there we are have a lot of questions, of questions uh, from the chat and the Q&A, and obviously they overlap with some of the questions we have prepared. So that's good. First, Ala, I have one uh, for you. Uh, you know, it's always uh, fun to see the questions. Maybe you know the people who ask them. But uh, this is a question from Abnabi uh, Alekri. Uh, to what extent did the regime succeed in dividing the people's rank along sectarian Sunni Shia lines and the division uh, the role of the division it played in undermining the uprising? This is a very important question, I think, that many people had on the front of their minds. Yeah, um, I, 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 I spoke about this as earlier. Um, I think in the beginning, you know, it's, it, there was unity and um, sectarianism was instrumentalized and weaponized in an, around an ethno-nationalist discourse of you know creating this trojan horse that the shia the fifth column you know constant barrage of disinformation fake news around the threat the takeover um you know i had colleagues at work having nightmares thinking they were going to be shipped on boats this is how fascism rises and gains power right so um to to kind of justify that um this you know it deepened this polarization and then then you see this you know people the working class if we are going to talk about class pitted against each other um, one, you know, one seeing their interest and ex existential survival around based on their loyalty, but also that the, the regime then benefits and privileges them. So there were 4,000 people that were sacked from public jobs uh, after 2011 and Bahrain teachers, doctors were removed and Sunnis were put in their place. 
um, and they would, you know, they they introduced McCarthyism, witch hunting. You know, just tell us if you have picture of anyone. There was a daily program on TV with people with their faces with circles on, and if you were snitched on, you know, by your neighbor, by your colleague, that meant material benefits for you. Um, so this eventually succeeds. I mean, this is not to say this is how this is how they maintain power and, and actually are quite confident and comfortable in the position they're in. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. There are two questions. There is one question for Helen. Uh, let, me, let me read it. So it's from Filippi saying, in your book, Yemen in Crisis, you debate the thesis about the war in Yemen as a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Can you explain a little bit more on this issue, especially the Ansar Allah Iran specific relation? And the other question to Lucia. Um, you wrote about the NATO intervention, the neo-colonial extraction of resources in Libya and the militarization of EU borders and their impact on the development of exploitation of sub-Saharan immigrants in Libya and in the Italian countryside. Could you please briefly speak to that? And as an Italian yourself, do you see any possibility of solidarity between the Italian and Libyan working people? Helen and then Lucia. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think it's a good idea to talk about this issue of proxies because there's a widespread misconception that, you know, the war in Yemen is now a proxy war between the Saudis and the Iranians. Now, there's absolutely no doubt that there's a serious rivalry, not to say enmity, between the Saudis and the Iranians. So that is, you know, unarguable. But that doesn't mean that you know the Houthis are Iranian proxies. If you look at the role of Iran in Yemen in the last decade, you will see um, you know that although it was basically non-existent, um, or it actually was in support of the Saleh regime until 2015, their support for the Houthis at the beginning was almost insignificant, and it has increased in the course of the last five or six years. We're now in the seventh year of the war, just in case anybody's forgotten. So you basically have a situation where certainly the Israelis are pushing the line that the Houthis are nothing but Iranian sort of dogs, dog bodies. Um, and you, know, you have a lot of that also in Western media. The situation is that the Houthis are now getting more support from the Iranians than they did at the beginning. It is also for the Iranians an extremely easy and cheap operation to make life difficult for the Saudis. The Iranians are reputed to be spending about $1 million a month or a year on, on, on the Houthis, whereas the Saudis are said to be spending billions per month on the war. So, you know, it's a really cheap and easy operation, but that does not mean that the Houthis are doing what the Iranians tell them. The Houthis have their own objectives, their own interests, their own ideology, which is in some senses becoming closer to that of Iranian Twelvers because they are Zaydis, which are Fivers. But it's not, you know, they are not taking orders from the Iranians. When the, the two interests coincide, they carry on and do it. But if the Houthis, if the Iranians ask the Houthis to do something that they don't want to do, they're not going to do it. If the Iranians drop the Houthis tomorrow, the, that would not end the role of the Houthis. They can continue their war without the Iranians. So, it, you know, I think it's very important to, in my view, to largely, if not completely dismiss the concept of the proxy war, to be a much more subtle and much more sophisticated in, in using it. You know, just as, you know, it's very hard to decide almost whether you know, the Houthis are, I mean, sorry, the Saudis are doing what suits the Americans or more a case of the Americans trying to do or not do what, uh, what suits the Saudis. So I think one needs to be much more sophisticated in looking at what's being done there. Thank you. Lucia? Thanks, Hansa. Well, what I would say is that because of the dynamics I was describing earlier on, uh, Western powers and corporations have been increasingly relying on militias in order to continue the extraction of Libyan resources. And if we look at the case of Italy, for example, 
well, Libya was one of the first countries who actually got a commitment to paying colonial reparations. And what we see after 2014 in particular is that Italy stops uh, the payment of reparation to the Libyan state. And uh, they also start to rely on militias to protect, for example, the multinational uh, gas and oil multinational, any um, uh, infrastructure and um, offshore uh, sites. And, uh, and these same militias uh, are also involved in the trafficking of uh, fuel, uh, human beings and weapons uh, from, from Libya. And so I think it's quite not very surprising that what we see is that because they have empowered and also given political power, the role of uh, Libyan Coast Guard to these uh, uh, trafficking militias, we have seen actually not stop a stop to migration, but actually an increase of migration that was stopped or reduced in 2017 because the Italian uh, secret services and the interior minister basically uh, paid these militias to basically change their strategy. So they accepted this money to change their strategy and reduce the departures. And what they shifted their focus on business of detention, uh, forced labor, and extortion uh, of, of the population. And so what we see after 2017 is the expansion of forced labor in all sectors of, of the economy. And uh, mm, also the, the fact that many people uh, are actually, an increasing number of people are increasingly detained in, in these uh, detention centers indefinitely. And so the idea that circulates in Europe and so on is that these people are detained because they want to go to Europe and they actually need to be stopped from doing this. But what came out from our research is that many, especially West African immigrants in Libya, would prefer to go back to their countries, but they cannot go back. So this system of detention is not really aimed at stopping them. Actually, it stops them at the same time, it gives them the only possibility to go to Europe because they can't go back uh, to their countries. So what we, we, we believe, Rosanna and I, is that this is more the creation of reserves reserves of uh, vulnerable labor that is exploited both in Libya and in Italy. And this of course creates competition in Italy because uh, especially people who have uh, uh, went through torture and, and so on in Libya feel like I, I spoke to people who said, well, even if I'm not paid at all, this is an improvement for me. So this of course generates a downward competition with workers, but at the same time can also generate a push to organize, and it has generated this push to organize. And so in terms of solidarity, I think it's important to understand this kind of dynamics, this kind of global dynamics that are uh, generated by these kind of systems uh, of border controls. And uh, the future of um, the labor movement will depend um, on the act activities of um, immigrant workers who are actually leading a new labor movement in Italy and their capacity to generate solidarity. I don't think uh, there will be a revival of the labor movement if these kind of conditions that generate uh, exploitation, super exploitation, global conditions are not addressed. Thanks, Lucia. Miriam, you have another question? Yeah, I have, uh, I'm trying to compile, the, uh, yes, sir, uh, 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 restart your brains. I'm going to ask you, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to compile the questions. So there's a couple of, of, of questions related to the uh, revolution. So I think what is really interesting in how we can conceptualize it, you mentioned the micro resistance and you mentioned getting out of this binary. I think it's interesting once we go into the ethnographic actual grassroots dynamics, the whole conversation changes. Like who can disagree, right? With like, can you tell us again what you studied and what you wrote in your book, that, but through an example of what to imagine when you talk about micro resistance, like from an ethnographic point of view, what's the example that you can give us that might also be relevant for all the other countries that we are part of or involved with so we can also uh, do the kind of thing we've seen with the Arab revolutions and recently where 
protesters in Hong Kong are telling uh, protesters in, in Sudan, this is how you should uh, use the umbrella where Egyptians are ordering pizzas for people in Wisconsin. Like how can your example of micro resistance uh, be relevant or is it only for Syria? Yeah, thank you for, for that question. And that's actually one of the main argument in, in my book. I'm, um, I argue in the book that um, geopolitics really is a lethal weapon against the revolts in the region and beyond. Um, that, uh, that geopolitics politics, trying to understand the revolt through a geopolitical lens um, basically silences those, those revolts. Uh, it invisibilizes them. Uh, we cannot understand the, the revolt in the Arab world without, uh, through geopolitics. And uh, a better way to do it is through what I'm calling micropolitics, trying to look at the revolt from the bottom up, trying to look at the struggles of the grassroots movement and try to understand those revolt in their complexity, the tensions, the conflicts, uh, and the messiness of, uh, of that um, experimentation. Um, there is not one unified story. As I suggested before, in Syria, what happened is a thousand different stories. Uh, but then there is also the big picture that is um, radical um, transformation and, and uh, radical change and decolonization of politics and, and thought and culture. Um, and the role of women, as I suggested before, is extremely important. Uh, the way that women and men confronted patriarchy in, in Syria. Um, and, and we need to do more of that, not by importing white colonial feminism to the region, but instead from by learning from Arab and Kurdish women, by black and indigenous queer feminism, and uh, trying to implement some of that. To go back to a case study or an example in, in Syria, I use the example of bread as, as a way to think about the revolution. Uh, bread because it's a vital commodity, um, a, a commodity that, you know, without which there is no revolution. Uh, and even with, before the revolution, uh, bread is, a, is an important commodity um, uh, for the Syrian diet. People, you know, uh, cannot eat without, without bread. And I think this is uh, generally true for people in, in the region. And so trying to look at the production the circulation and the consumption of bread as a way to understand the revolution from that, you know, those nodes and what happens in each one of those nodes. How is the the, the wheat, you know, produced and and uh, sent to the city, um, and the production and the circulation and and the consumption. And I tell a number of stories. For example, the the, the fact that the Syrian regime tried to weaponize bread and wheat and used it as a weapon of war against the revolution is very important to understand you know, the response from the revolutionary and people on the ground and the grassroots movement. For example, they ended uh, the bakery, the centralized bakery, because they were targeted and bombed by the Syrian regime. And instead they started distributing bread in different uh, neighborhoods. And there, to do that, they had to gather data about who's there and understand the needs of the refugees who were uh, in, you know, present in the city in mass. The same thing is for the circulation of, exchange of bread and wheat from one region to another. I mean, there was so much complexity and tension even among the liberated region when people cared about, uh, uh, about each other. And yet it was difficult to share, you know, that important commodity, which is bread and wheat between one city and another, even in the liberated region. And so instead of just jumping to imperialism and anti-imperialism and Israel and Qatar, and let, let's try to think about those, uh, those questions and understand them better and be prepared for the second and third round of, of the revolt. How do we uh, address those you know, micro politics of everyday life? How do we make it you know, possible for, for kids to go back to school? Another example that I will, you know, I will end with that, uh, the Syrian, um, the, uh, the revolutionary teachers in Menbej, I always tell that story, thought that um, many, many kids were in the street, not going to back to school and so on. And the rate of, of dropout was around 80 to 90%. And so they had a meeting that I attended and they said, we need to go back to school. And um, an informant of the regime told the regime, obviously, the next day, and the two airplanes came and bombed empty schools, sending a signal to the people in Menbej that there's no education possible in those regions, no education without Assad. Um, and so, again, I mean, this, those are some of the questions that we need to, to address. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Yasser, about this. Um, I think we have one last question. I think we received more than 40, 50 questions. Unfortunately, we cannot answer all of them. But I think the last question would give um, an idea about the future and the perspectives. So eight years after the first wave of the uprisings, we saw a second wave in Sudan, Algeria, 
Iraq and Lebanon, demonstrating that the revolutionary process in the region is still alive and showing the people's determination to continue fighting for their rights. So what do you think are the lessons to be learned from the first wave of, of the uprising? So do you think that these uprisings learned lessons from, from the uprisings back in 2010, 2011? And are you optimistic for the future when it comes um, um, to, to the countries and the context you're analyzing? So I think these questions will give it to Ella and Helen, and then we'll wrap up. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I mean, in 2019, I, um, I, w I visited Lebanon while, while protesters there were occupying the, the central square and uh, just following kind of what was happening in Sudan. You know, there were small little kind of practices that, that they, you, you, could, you can sense protesters learned from, you know, the kind of the role of arts and culture within these protests, the role of music, the central role of women celebrating those things rather than accepting them as sort of, you know, as ruptures that were just there. They, they kind of, they, they, they took the good bits of, of the Arab revolutions and of the 2011 and translated them into their own context in those kind of ways, you know, having these kind of iconic central activist figures, um, the way they were spoke to the media, um, it felt like, you know, it was, there was some learning that was happening there. I mean, I think each context, each country can be understood in its own context. So for example, I think Bahrain is maybe closest to Egypt in the sense that there are these peri periodic uprisings of revolution, repression and restoration um, that, that maintain, you know, these, these um, basically, even if it's a president or a monarch for long periods of time, decades even, you know, you can see Sisi is the new pharaoh and, and the king of Bahrain, he's been in power for 20 years or so, um, and his uncle passed away after 40 years in power. So, so you know, the kind of the idea of retaining these old aging um, monarchs for the future is, is central to how the state is, is planning going forward, but fundamentally, there's a disrupted social contract without there being this, this um, uh, social contract between state and citizen around more democratic rights, the risk and, and the possibility, the, inevitab the ine inevitability of another episode uh, of another crisis coming um, very soon, in fact, I think, because the conditions the material conditions are even worse today than they were in 2011, economically, politically, um, and the sense of despair, you know, even with the pandemic happening, they, they can only, that's only amplifying um, the, the uh, despair around those conditions. So I think it's a question of time. Thank you, Ella. Helen? Yeah, I think what I'll try and do is combine uh, answering your question and giving my final remarks so that might <laughs> do things a little bit. I haven't, I mean, I've followed, of course, these other um, events that are happening in these other countries. And I also spent a few days in Lebanon in 2019. So I did get some experience. My impression from what I've read and what I've seen is that certainly the Sudanese have learned one of the basic lessons, which is that you need to have some kind of organization and you know a system of basically getting together and having common demands. And that was certainly lacking in Lebanon when I was there. Um, and I'm not sure from what I've read about Algeria um, and Iraq that I don't get the impression it's there, but that could be me not seeing, you know, I don't see everything that come, that happens and happens in these places. So I think that's, you know, th those are the, the, to me, the main lessons that need to be learned for future uprisings and revolutions is that, you know, regardless of differences, one needs to have some kind of actual organization that's going to work. And that really brings me up to, 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 to what I would say were my final remarks. And that's picking up on what Yasser just said. He's talking, talking about grassroots events. You know, I think if you look at the war in Yemen today, there's no immediate prospect of it ending. What has been learned and what has happened if you look at the last 10 years, as I said earlier, you've had, um, you know, the movement in the 2011 brought together people who never thought they should talk to each other, who never thought they had any common interests. They were from different regions, from different social origins and different, uh, you know, ambitions, different interests, different socioeconomic circumstances. But they all came together with these limited uh, objectives. 
and mainly they, although they didn't get organized, they were talking to each other and people talked to people they never thought they would talk to. And I think what's really important and what's happening now in the, during the war, and that refers really to what Yasser was saying, is the building up of grassroots elements and community-based activities. Now, community-based development activities, relief activities, mutual support, et cetera, you know, can come in all forms and shapes, and they can come from very straightforward sort of religious or moralistic solidarity, but they can also be elements that can be used to base, build up a political movement and a new politics in the future. And when you are looking in Yemen in particular, you have a bunch of leaders on all sides, and I'm saying on all sides because there's a multiplicity of sides, you know, who, who, who care about anything except the population, except the 30 million people who are suffering on a daily basis. But what can emerge gradually over time, I think, is a political movement based on these community development, community activities, which could help in the future for a new, a new approach to politics, which I think is essential if there's going to be any serious uh, solution to Yemen. And just very quickly to pick up on what Alas said, you know, without a different political formula to run the country, you know, there will, it will just be a perpetuation. This crisis will be papered over and another one will occur. You know, unless you solve the fundamental socioeconomic problems of the population by changing completely out of the neoliberal formula, you know, and moving to a political formula that will serve the interests and respond to the needs of the vast majority of the population, you're just going to shift from one crisis to the other. Thank you. Thanks a lot for these um, wonderful final words, Helen. This has been a great discussion, and I wish we had more time to delve into more of the complexities. For me, um, the two main takeaway messages from the conversation that we had today are uh, one, imperialism and capitalism are global processes that are experienced differently uh, depending on where you live. And it happens that in the MENA region, they are experienced through brutal dictatorships and a state of permanent war and imperialist interventions. And second, we can't separate anti-authoritarianism from anti-imperialism in our struggles for emancipation. As I said earlier, this is part of a series of webinars to reflect on a decade of struggles in the Arab region. The next one would focus on Algeria, Sudan, Western Sahara and Morocco, and will be on 24th of June. You can already register for it, and my colleagues will post a link in the chat. There is also another webinar uh, organized by TNI on the 28th of, of April, and it's Agrarian Conversations about global food regimes and China with great speakers, so do register for it. You can also listen to the great series of podcasts that my colleague Sean curates. It's called State of Power and covers various issues to make sense of the world's com most complex challenges. We've recorded one recently on the ongoing Algerian uprisings, so do listen to it um, when you have time. TNI offers these webinars, podcasts, and its research for free. And as you know, it takes time and a lot of resources. So we will be grateful if you can support our work by donating through the link you see on, in the chat. Finally, I'd like to thank all our speakers. You've been truly great. Thanks to Miriam, Jess, Maha, Katie, and Dania for making this webinar run smoothly. A big thank you goes to our interpreters, Muhammad and Sana, who definitely did a great job. And finally, thanks to all our audiences for joining us and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. That was great. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah, it's been an interesting talk. And Are we I offline? Hope... Are we 